Thank you very much. My name is Grace Lawrence. I very recently achieved my PhD from Swinburne. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and I had the pleasure of working with my supervisors, Professors Alan Duffy, Darren Croton, and Chris Blake. And I'm really honoured to be here to tell you all about my thesis today. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but dark matter within simulated Milky Way analogues and their subsequent direct detection possibilities on Earth. If we go outside right now and look up at the night sky with our eyes or maybe with a telescope, we might see something that looks like this. This is from JWST, so not quite this good, but you'd see something similar. And it's kind of difficult to comprehend just how much light you see. The sky seems fit to burst with these beautiful twinkling lights. But what if I told you that everything that you see in the night sky not just the stars and the planets, but everything on Earth too, from the trees, to you, to me, actually makes up less than 5% of our universe. We are this tiny, inconsequential orange sliver. And if we want to investigate the other 95%, we have to venture into the dark sector. We have to look at dark energy and dark matter. But before we do, Let's just take a moment and congratulate ourselves because we are a rare sparkly piece of the universe and that's pretty cool. So kudos to everyone here. Now, dark matter is this mysterious substance. It's non-luminous, it's invisible, it doesn't absorb light, it doesn't emit light. The true nature of dark matter is one of the greatest modern mysteries of astrophysics and there's definitely a Nobel Prize waiting for the team that finally discovers it. But if we can't see it, if we can't feel it, if it's invisible, how do we know it exists? There is actually a plethora of observational evidence for dark matter, from the rotational velocity curves of galaxies, to gravitational lensing, to the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. There is evidence everywhere that dark matter exists, but it's all indirect. That is to say, we're observing the effects that dark matter has on these processes and not dark matter itself. So, what was the goal of this research? What did we want to do? We aimed to model the kinematic properties of dark matter for directly detecting it on Earth, and we do that using supercomputer simulations. And we wanted to explore how realistic dark matter distributions from simulations differed our predictions for detection when we compared them against our standard mathematical models, our standard halo model, very creatively named. And you might be asking, why is it important to know what dark matter is? If it's everywhere, but we can't see it and we can't touch it, why do we care? And there's quite a few reasons to care. So dark matter will tell us what the future looks like. Dark matter is the building blocks of our universe and it dictated how our universe formed and if we've come to understand it well enough, it will tell us what the next steps in our universe look like. Not to mention the technology we're developing to search for dark matter is already having applications in defence research, in medical research, in mining and so many others. So it's worthwhile whether you like blue sky research or not. Now, one of the ways that we can directly detect dark matter is by searching for the signal called annual modulation. Now, I've got this pretty little diagram. This here represents our solar system, which is within our galaxy. Every galaxy in the universe is embedded within this extended dark matter halo, which is what we're seeing in the nice purple around the edge. Now, as our solar system moves around the centre of our galaxy, it creates this headwind effect, so it appears that dark matter is rushing through the solar system constantly. Now, as the solar system moves around the galactic centre and the Earth moves around the Sun, we have this mapping of the flux of dark matter through the Earth, and it comes out to be, quite conveniently, a lovely sinusoidal signal. Now, how do we actually search for that? We use something called direct detection, and it's slightly more complicated, but at the crux, all you need to directly detect dark matter is a detector material, so some sort of crystal. You need your ghostly dark matter particles ready to go, and you need something to detect them with. We normally use photomultiplier tubes. So as the dark matter comes flying through the Earth, it flies in, it interacts with the detector. Now, some of the particles are going to interact with the detector, but not many. The rest are going to float on through like nothing's ever happened, 
But the ones that did stop to interact with the detector are going to impart some energy to the crystal via a mechanism called nuclear recoil. And in our experiment, that sort of happens as a flash, which we can then observe, say Eureka, and collect our Nobel Prize. <laughs> It's worth noting too that Australia is helping to lead the way in direct detection. So there is an experiment called the SABRE experiment and that's sodium iodide with active background rejection. Um, and we're building it right here in Victoria. It's being built underground in the active stall gold mine. Uh, and it's a very exciting project I'd love to chat more about afterwards. Um, and I had to show, I got to visit Princeton at the beginning of my PhD and here I am building some of the crystals uh, to go into one of these experiments. So we now know what dark matter is and why we want to find it. Let's get into the fun bit, which is the research. In order to be able to predict how we're going to detect dark matter, we need to have an understanding and a model of how dark matter is distributed throughout the galaxy. Now, because we can't actually detect dark matter, we go to simulations. So I've chosen the latte simulations that came from the FIRE collaboration uh, at Caltech in the US, and they are stunning hydrodynamic simulations. So this is the halo that I chose. And on the right here is a zoomed in visualization of just the dark matter component of the halo. And the bright rainbow circles around the edge represent regions that I sampled the dark matter from. And it's in a very special region called the solar circle. So that's the region that our sun would move through as it rotates around the galactic center. So we're trying to get an idea of the dark matter environments that our Earth will uh, interact with. To make a prediction about what we're going to find with dark matter, one of the most important things we need to know is how fast it's traveling, or the velocity distribution function. So we're gonna build a velocity distribution function, just quickly. We've got a probability distribution on the y-axis and the speed of dark matter on the x-axis. So let's throw in one of our samples. It looks all right. It's a pretty standard shape. It's a little bit messy, but it's come from a simulation, so we'll let that slide. Now, let's fit it with the model. So this is our standard halo model, which tells us that dark matter should behave like a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Most scientists in the audience are familiar with a Maxwellian. It fits pretty well. It's not perfect, but by eye, it's not a bad fit. We then do a fun frame transformation to find the geocentric velocity distribution function. And all this is, is a term for the speed that the detector will observe the dark matter at. And that's the really important part of this calculation. So let's take a step back and look at it in the context of all the samples that we took. Now, we just looked at the nice smooth one which matched the model, but seven out of the eight samples actually vary quite drastically from what we expect. So to help you out, circled in red, we've got these lovely big high velocity spikes in that high velocity tail of our velocity distribution function. So that's interesting and it's very different from the model that we usually use to model direct detection. And we also know that our rate calculations strongly depend on these speed distributions. So let's plug them in and calculate some predictions for a dark matter detector. We had, do have to make a few assumptions here. So there's 75 equations that go into making this plot, but all we really need to know is that this is for a germanium-based detector, and we've taken a dark matter mass. We're assuming a dark matter particle, which is 15 giga electron volts in weight. What we're looking at here is a differential rate uh, count rate. But all that really means is the amount of dark matter particles a detector will find per day, per, thank you, per kilogram of detector, per small energy region. And that's as a function of time. We can see that we're getting less than a count per day across all samples, which fits with what, with what we expect from theory. And also that we're peaking in the middle of the year, which is a great sort of bit of confirmation bias, but that is absolutely what we expect to see. So we know this is working okay. We're seeing some intrinsic scatter in the samples just because they are coming from a messy, realistic distribution, but they also agree with each other. So they're not actually differing. Their error bars are overlapping, which is really, really convenient. If you cast your mind back to last slide, all of that messy velocity distribution, we would have expected that to propagate through. But what we found was that by the time we actually put those velocities through the machinery of a direct detection calculation, very little of the scatter persists. And this is really uh, reaffirming for everyone who works within the field 
because the standard HALO model is what we base everything on. So the next step, now that we've looked at this, is we wanted to try a slightly different mass model. So we said, instead of this being 15 giga electron volts, why don't we make it 30 or 60, just to see it's 60. And this is what happened. So on the left-hand side, we have our regular rate. It's showing a sort of amplitude that we expect. It's peaking in the middle of the year, but, um, and it's spoiled a bit early, the high mass model on the right completely changes its phase. Now, this is really interesting because so much of our theory dictates that we need the signal to peak in the middle of the year. And the fact that we can theoretically and through modeling and calculations predict a complete flip of the signal is kind of astonishing. So this phase flip occurs at a certain energetic point called the critical turnover energy. And if used correctly, if you can observe this turnover experimentally, you can actually use it to find out the mass of the dark matter particle you're seeing. So it's a really, really intriguing tool. I'd like to probably wrap it up here. So what we found during uh, some of this thesis work was that all of our velocity distributions that came from our simulations uh, demonstrated drastic deviations from our standard HALO model, but that the predictions for the standard HALO model and the predictions using the simulations didn't differ very much, so that messiness from the simulations and the velocities didn't propagate through. And, thank you, that the critical turnover energy can be used by direct detection experiments as a tool to constrain WIMP dark matter. So, just to finish up, I wanted to end by saying that in the 10 minutes that I've been talking tonight, 36 million or thereabout dark matter particles rushed through each and every person in the audience. <laughs> so even though dark matter is invisible, that can make it seem like an abstract concept to think about. But dark matter is ever present in this room, around the earth, throughout the universe, and research like this helps us put a spotlight on dark phenomena. Thank you.